Hey, good morning. Welcome to God Manifest. I am live in Goliath, Texas right now, which is just south of Houston, about two and a half, uh, two and a half hours south of Houston. I am at Goliath uh, County Fellowship right now. A good friend of mine, Debbie Phillips, and I have just been hanging out, and Olivia have been hanging out for a while. I met a lot of really, really good friends. Um, just shared my testimony here, but I'm really excited that y'all are joining us. Uh, I just wanted to start off by honoring the soldiers who have, who have, who have fallen for our freedom. Uh, we just thank y'all. We thank the families and the friends and the and the soldiers who are living right now who've lost family and friends um, fighting for us. And we honor you. We honor the sacrifice. And we honor and we thank every single person and family and friends that have lost people as well. I know the sacrifice isn't just their life, but also you've lost, you lost brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, and you've lost a lot of um, loved ones as well. And we honor y'all for your, for the loss, and we thank y'all for the sacrifice you've made as well for us. All right, so it's time for offerings. We just thank everyone who's watching us online, all this, all the being able to uh, support us, God manifest in everything that we do. This last Thursday was a three-year anniversary, so we're out in Goliath. We've been hanging out here since actually Wednesday night, and we're really, really, really excited that um, that we're here, and uh, we just thank you for your support. You can go to godmanifest.com for slash donate and continue to su- your support. Uh, of us and everything God is doing through us. So please turn to John 16, 13. I'm reading from the NASB. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all, into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what, what is to come. So since my salvation in 2003, God has had me share these simple truths when I minister, that God has always loved us. God is always speaking. And every believer here and every believer of Jesus Christ, everyone who's been saved by the blood of Christ, can hear God's voice. And I found it really, really odd when I first got saved and I began to go to these churches and I'm hearing the voice of God and a lot of these people are looking at me kind of in, in shock that a brand new believer is hearing the voice of God. But I'm here to tell you that as a believer, you are equipped to hear the voice of God and to release the words that God speaks to you. So when I was first saved, I was saved from Buddhism. I began to learn about all the different unique gifts that God has imparted into us through the Holy Spirit. But the greatest gift, I believe, is, is being in God's very presence and also being able to hear and do and partner with God in everything he has, he has planned for our lives. Now, one of the things I've also learned about the five offices in which God allows us to serve. There are five offices created to serve. And that's the apostle, that's the prophet, that's the evangelist, the pastors, and the teachers. A lot of people look at those things and, 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 and they think they're supposed to rule the church, but instead they should be at the bottom serving the church. That makes sense. If Jesus Christ came and served, the King of Kings is serving us. We as leaders for Christ should be at the very bottom serving up. And I think that's a big, big misconception in the church right now. Uh, I've went to so many different churches where they lift up the apostle, they lift up the prophet, they lift up the pastor, they lift up these evangelists. I say we honor those people, but they're, if, if they're asking you to lift them up, there's, there's, there's a misalignment there. Um, as a prophetic voice in our church and our pastors, Olivia and I, we aim to serve our, our members and to serve the body of Christ. And I think it's really important to have that balance in the church where the pastors, prophets, teachers, evangelists are all re- re- really in a position of a servitude. But the body should also serve them as well. And I think in Christ, in, in church, we should be serving one another. We should be all arriving to receive and serve and be a part of the body um not to be not to not to worship one another not to covet one another we can cover the gifts of god because when you covet those gifts of god god will release that to you freely because the gifts are freely given so turn to first corinthians 14 i'm going to read verses one through five it says pursue love yet earnestly oh wait pursue love Yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. That's all spiritual gifts. But especially 
that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands. But then in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consultation. One who speaks in tongues edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you will, now, now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy, and greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive the edification. So 1 Corinthians, y'all know it's an epistle. An epistle is really simply stated, it's a letter. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the, to, the, to the church of Corinth. And he's writing this letter. A lot of times he's correcting, he's directing, he's, he's teaching, he's releasing. He's, so in this instance, he's saying, yeah, speaking tongues is awesome. Desire that. Gifts are awesome. Desire that. But the gift of prophecy is to edify the church. It's to grow. It's to exalt. It's to do amazing things in the church. I was just talking to Thad right now, and I said, when he begins to pray, he prays prophetically. He's, he's calling forth what, what the Spirit of God has shown him when he prays. He's not praying what he sees in the natural. Like our church is a smaller church. We're in a house church. But when we pray, we're praying as though we're speaking to millions of people, not just the eight or 30 people who are in attendance at that time. It's, it's, it's important for us as you pray and you speak for us to say, Lord, what are you saying right now? Lord, what are you doing right now? Lord, what would you like me to say and do right now? I think it's, it's, it's so, vi- it's, so in, it's invaluable to have that relationship with God to where we seek him first. It says seek first the kingdom of heaven, right? Well, I say seek first the kingdom of heaven and the king of the kingdom. If you seek the king of the kingdom, now you're hearing directly from the source. It's our job as believers to figure out what, where God's heart is positioned and head towards that position, right? So you, sometimes you walk in a room, you think, I'm gonna walk in a room, I'm gonna talk to Dennis. Well, what if I walk in a room and God says, talk to Wendy? We have to be open for that, right? We have to be open for the Holy Spirit. We don't know if, it's, if the Holy Spirit is coming or going. It's, it's, it's just described like a wind. The Holy Spirit is also described like a river and water and oil. But what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the things, what's, what are the, what's the common denominator between water, oil, and, and, and wind? It, it fills the space, the shape of the space, and it moves freely, right? You, you pour water and it moves freely. So as followers of Jesus Christ, we should be willing to put our genders down and move freely according to what the Spirit says. Like I mentioned to y'all just earlier, I have a few books I'm written, and I have a few books I'm writing as well. What I do with God is I, I wake up and God says, I said, what do you want to do today? He says, I want to write. Okay, which book? And he tells me which book, which chapter would you like to write on today? He tells me which chapter. Uh, it, it JC, tra- it's, it's, tra- it's training ourselves and training, my, training, training our mind to be able to say, hey, God, I'm not after my own agenda and my own will. I'm after yours. I wrote that book, 168 page book. I wrote this book in six days. So I'm driving, how the book was written was I'm driving to work. I worked for a law firm at that time. No, I worked, no, I worked for a, as a marketing director at the time. I'm driving to work. God says, let's write our story. Right? You have a story with God. God may say to you, let's tell our story. We all have a personal journey and a personal story with God. And your story becomes a, a, a prophetic declaration of what God can do for another person. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 14, 31 to 33. And again, I'm reading from the NASB. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all men learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of, the, of prophets are subjects to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of all the saints. So when I was, when I train people how to prophesy, how to live by the Spirit, a lot of times I'll just, they say, hey, I'm at a, I'm at a fork, Jonathan. Y'all have been at a fork? 
this looks great and this looks good. But my question to them, I said, which, which one's God? And they said, how do I know? And I said, peace. And in this, it talks about peace. Lord, God is the prince of peace. So when you move in these directions, you may be walking towards a storm, but you're safer walking towards a storm if God's calling you to walk in that storm than walking away from it if God's not calling you to walk away from it. You're safer in his presence. You're safer in his will. Imagine like an umbrella. You're walking and an umbrella is floating, right? Like traveler's insurance is a little umbrella that floats around. That's the will of God. You're safer walking underneath that through the, through the biggest storms of your life than you are walking walking in, in, a, in a beautiful garden without the will of God. And a lot of us are taught to say, hey, this is good, therefore it's God. And I say, I believe that only the thing God has you doing at this very moment is a, good, is a, is a thing that's aligned by God. You can do all these good things. If they say feeding the homeless is good, but I say feed the homeless that God tells you to feed. If God says start a homeless ministry, start a homeless ministry. If God says, I want you to feed this one gentleman, feed that one gentleman. If God says, I want you to, to honor this teacher who's, 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 the, who's been tearing all the students apart, you honor that teacher and you ask God how. I've had hard bosses. You know, Debbie and I have been talking about this recently. I've had hard bosses. And, and the question I haven't asked about a hard, some of my hard bosses was, God, how do I love this boss? How do I honor this boss? How, how do I show you to someone who doesn't want you? And a lot of times you're in situations where you can't say God's name, but you surely can show him, show them God's presence. So what is prophecy? The Greek word for prophecy means proclaiming the mind of God about what God knows. I can't, I couldn't pronounce the Greek word for prophecy, but it means that. It means proclaiming the mind of God about what God knows. So the one thing, one thing I do when we minister is we speak identity into people, right? Dennis, I, for instance, when I said identity, I saw you as a rock, a big boulder. But God, God, God brings you up to the hilltop. And he lets you roll down over the things he wants to destroy, the, the things that enemy. He positions you higher up to destroy the things that the enemy has, has is positioned below. Imagine someone trying to, an army is coming up a, a hilltop trying to take over a summit. The reason why you have so many hardships is because the enemy knows how dangerous you are. So in, in prophecy is being able to see what God is seeing in a someone in someone you don't know or someone you do know, but calling out the things that God sees, not what you see in the natural. It may some of the things you you God wants to talk about may be the natural thing that you see. This person looks hungry, and God may say he's hungry. And in other instances, God may say, man. The hardship you've gone through is because the enemy has tried to is trying to prevent you from getting in getting into the position God wants you at. He wants you at the summit so he can position you to crush the enemy. But the enemy is trying to keep you in the valley and not in and not in the high position. That's why I paid favor over you earlier. And God is all knowing. He knows everything that happened in your past. You can't approach God and say, Lord, I love you, and, and think you're keeping a secret from him. He knows everything. He knows everything you're doing in the present. He knows every thought that's coming to my mind right now. And he knows everything that, everything that will happen. And that same God lives in you. What does that mean for you? You have access to it. The Father in heaven is giving you direct access to hear his heart, hear his mind, and partner with him. Partnering him, I'm not saying it's easy. It takes a lot of faith. It puts you in some odd situations. Uh, it's not my. It's, I'm gonna give you sure y'all a testament that's not even in here. I shared with Debbie just recently was a carjacking when I was first saved, three months into salvation. Don't go out and do this unless God tells you. But three months into salvation, I was still an alcoholic. 
I was, I, I, but I was learning to hear God. And then God delivered me from alcoholism a few months after that. So I went to the store to get an alcohol and to get a frozen pizza. I was a broke college student and I was still an alcoholic. On the way out, after I purchased, the, purchased my food, God said audibly, and it's a convenience, it's a, it's a supermarket called Randall's and other places they know him as Tom Thumb. So I'm walking out of the supermarket and God says, carjacker. I stop. I see this big man wearing, wearing, uh, 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 wearing a red coat, a plaid coat. And, I, and God says, him. And I went, thank you, Jesus, for saving me from the carjacker. And I turned to walk away and got to give him a ride. How many of y'all would see a man with a gun in his hip? God tell you he's a carjacker and give, how many of y'all would give him a ride? It wasn't me at that time. And I went, okay, so I heard God warn me and I'm hearing the devil trying to kill me. That's what I thought. I'm a brand new Christian. I'm like, man, I'm still hearing the devil. Devil, get away from me. God's saving me right now. And I took another step. God says, it's me. Give him a ride. And I thought, man, I've been saved for three months and you're martyring me already? I read about this in the Bible. This, this, this is, I don't think it's supposed to happen in three months. But I have a brand new, at that time, white Toyota Tacoma. It was big Texas wheels. And I was like, I just got this truck. My first new truck ever in my life. And now you're going to, Give, you want me to give up my life and give up my truck at the same time. So I walk up to this guy and he, he was a big guy. I'm Asian, so I'm short. So this big guy was looking at me and he says, he goes, excuse me, sir. And I went, hey, stop. Do you need a ride? His eyes opened up really big and he goes, excuse me? I said, do you need a ride? I, I'm from the ghetto. So I was like, look, let's cut to the chase. I'm going to give you a ride wherever you want. You're going to kill me. You're going to take my truck. This is God's will, I think. And he goes, yes. And I went, good, come on. I'm in that brand new Ford uh, Toyota Tacoma I just bought last month. Hop in, I'll take you anywhere you want in Houston. And he gets, and as he's turning the corner, before he opens the passenger side door, I see him adjusting in the mirror, the gun that he was gonna kill me with. So he can sit down and, and it's not po poking it, it's in his thigh. And I was thinking, I hope I'm hearing from God. So he gets in, he sits there and he stares at me. My car started, I'm sitting there in reverse with my foot on the brake and I look at him and I said, so? He goes, what? And I went, where are we going? And he goes, uh, uh, just hop on the street. And I said, okay, take a right, okay. And I'm driving, get the next light. Where are we going? He goes, uh, take a right, okay. And, he, and finally he says, can I ask you a question, sir? And I said, yeah, and he goes, why did you offer me a ride? And I said, you wanna hear something crazy? I said, God told me you needed a ride. And he goes, why? And then suddenly God, God downloaded a prophetic vision of what just happened in the past. And I said, you're, I think you, you're, you have a roommate that's black. Yes. You live in apartments across the street. Yes. You got up and, uh, and you put something in your belt and you said to that, your friend, your roommate, I'm gonna go get me a ride. He goes, yes. And I said, well, God apparently told me you needed a ride and I'm your ride. Where are we going, man? I'm so harsh. I'm so mad. God's sacrificing me. If not just me, just my truck. I was, I was imagining I'm either going to be dead on a ditch and he's going to have my truck, or I'm going to be standing inside of the road and he's going to have my truck. Either way, that sucks, right? I'm like, man, this sucks. Either way, I'm not going to have a truck and I may be dead. So, And he goes, well, why, why would God do that? And I said, apparently he likes you. So... I'm thinking, dude, he likes this guy who's going to rob, rob and carjack me more than me, is my thought. Um, apparently, he likes you and he loves you, whatever. It's just, you need a ride. I'm giving you I'm a ride. Where are we going, man? We drive a few, a few more miles. He goes, right, turn down this road. And it's a dead end. I was like, oh, this is it. Great. Walking with you, God, for three months has been great. <laughs> no, my truck's going to be gone. I'm going to be dead in this dead end. No one's going to find me. My mom's going to be wondering where, where I am with my pizza and my wine, you know. And uh, he says, stop, as I pull in, get, let me get out. He gets out and he looking, he's looking at me and I'm waiting for him to shoot me. I said, and he goes, go. I said, what? He goes, go, sir. Just, just turn around and go. And I went, is this where you're trying to, this is a dead end, man. I said, 
where are you? Where am I taking you? Get back in. Go. And I went, all right. So I drive and I drive off. And I asked God a few years later, what's up with that? And God said, I wanted to see if I could trust you. And I said, what happened to the man? He goes, he found out I loved him. Isn't that crazy? God brought me through this prophetic act to see how much he can trust me with his voice. Stewarding God's voice is, is a prophetic part. You know how you steward something? I gave you a hundred bucks and say, hey, here's a hundred dollars. How are you going to steward it? Are you going to blow it on frivolous things? Or are you going to invest it in something that will multiply God's kingdom? Gift of prophecy is a, is a, it's God's investment into you. Hey, I'm going to trust you with my voice. And I'm going to ask you to do stuff for me, God says. And then the more you do, the more I'm going to ask and the more people are going to be touched. Now, prophecy, I shared a little bit, I think, for who I shared it with. It might have been Linda. I said, hey, I, I prayed for Debbie recently. And God gave me a word of knowledge. That I'm, there's a difference between word of knowledge and prophecy. A word of knowledge that her right patella was hurting. The, a word of knowledge is a gift from God as well. You all can research. A word of knowledge is knowing something that's intimate and personal of somebody that no one else knows. I pray for her. The next day, she's feeling 100% better. And she tells us, tells me, hey, I had surgery in that knee. I had the patella removed and replaced. You didn't know that. Because God knew. And it was, it was her time to get healed from that knee. Why didn't God heal her before their surgery? I don't know. And, it, and it's still a miracle yet. Isn't that fun? Just living with God. And just it's just so amazing being able to live with God and do as he says, and, and God will perform miracles, signs, and wonders through you because he wants to partner with you. We are the bride of Christ collectively and singly, singularly. You are the bride of Christ, and we are the bride of Christ, and God wants to co-labor with his bride. We're the bride of Christ standing next to the king of kings doing what he wants to do for his children. Is that making sense? Like when I got married, I asked God, oh my gosh, I'm married. Everything I freaking do affects her now. I can't be a husband. I'm not worthy to be a husband. Why? Because my dad was an alcoholic. Everything he did affected us negatively. We were homeless three times. He cheated my mom with prostitutes 2,000 times, he said. He's lost $2 million gambling. So we've been broke my entire life, living, living paycheck to paycheck because he couldn't stop his gambling and drinking and womanizing. And I thought, man, everything he did, even in secret, affected my life. How am I going to be a good husband? And God says, I don't even know what a good husband looks like. And God says, look at me. Look at how I love my bride. And you are to love your bride the same way. The first thing he showed me was Jesus on the cross. And I was like, you know, I need to die to myself just to love my wife correctly. Ladies, look for a husband that does that. That's willing to die to themselves. Because, you know, a, a pastor of, that we, we love says they've never seen a woman have an issue submitting to a man that loves them well. Because they know that every decision the man is making is for the benefit of the, of the, of the his bride and his family, y'all's dad. There's sacrifices he's made. There's dreams that he gave up. To be a good husband and a good father. And what happens? I had a dream. I ran my own design firm when Olivia met me. I gave it all up, and Olivia now is like, "Don't you have a dream of running your own marketing firm again?" Let's do this. A good bride goes, hey, husband, I know it's not about all about me. It's about you, too. As a bride of Christ, we should be looking through our good, good father and our good, good bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and saying, hey, you, did, you sacrificed so much for me. What can I do for you? And when you start doing for him, you realize, oh my gosh, this is the funnest life I've ever had. Y'all want to hear some cool testimonies? 
So here's a word of knowledge. I was at, I was at a church out in uh, Pasadena, California, near Hollywood. And I'm sitting there. I look over. There's this couple sitting there, British couple, never met before in my life. And God says, go tell that girl that she, she is the bell. She is my bell. So I was like, Olivia was there. I got up. Olivia was watching me. I just get up. I walk over there. And I said, hey, I'm Jonathan. Nice to meet you. You are God's bell. And she starts to cry. She said, my name is Bella. And my dad calls me Bell. He just died last week. Word of knowledge. Rocked her world. She wrote me the other day. She said, my heart healed that day. I started a women's ministry for, for people with broken hearts. And I'm, I'm, I'm ministering to broken women right now all over London. Because of that one word of knowledge. That was it. That's all released. You are God's bell. The father, he, I, I think I said, our father in heaven says you're his bell. He, and, and God knew exactly that was enough confirmation for her to hear. My father on earth called me bell. And you have no idea my name is Bella. What are the chances of that? Very good when you're, when you're in the spirit of God. Now afterwards, I came back and sat down. I'm kind of teary-eyed. Olivia goes, what happened? I said, um, I told that lady her name that she's God's bell. She goes, okay, what's her name? Bella. She goes, that's awesome. And I was like, I was like, it is awesome. And I said, now I'm all emotional. I was like, and I said, man, I fought God for like 45 minutes during worship from, for, from doing that. 45 minutes, I'm sitting there going, I'm not doing that. Calling a woman bell isn't gonna make any sense to this woman. She's gonna think I'm crazy. But calling her bell made perfect sense to her her heart was broken and she was mourning the loss of her natural father and and her father in heaven wanted her to know daughter you still have a father and i love you pretty cool right one day i was a part of another church one of our members i haven't seen him in months and he had he had a cap on he's just sitting there and we, we were all lined up all the leaders we were giving prophetic words to everyone at the church i think the church was 50 people at that time we were just taking turns so I, I'm, I'm always the, the, I'm the one that fills in the gaps. When, when no one has a word, I just point at someone and give a word without having a word. Why? Because I know my God, I know that my father loves you and your father loves you. That's the beauty of, of having, knowing you have a, this tight relationship with God. So I'm sitting there, radio silence, halfway through it, right? And everyone's looking at each other. And my pastor looks at me like, do something. Like, and I went, his name is um, Eldred. And I said, Eldred. And he goes, yeah. And I said, you have long, lo I said, I, I know your hair is buzz cut, but you have long locks of hair. I saw you take off your helmet and these long locks of hair. And God's giving you an added strength of power, like Samson. I haven't seen him in months. And he goes, takes his cap. His hair was as long as yours. Last time I was on, he had a buzz cut. And he goes, and he starts tearing up and he says, I grew my hair out long because God told me to grow it out like Samson. I didn't know that. I just shared what I saw and you can do the same. Are y'all are, are getting me? You can do the same. This sounds all neat and cool, but you can do the same. There's this lady that walks up for prayer. She said, hey, I'm going to go to Cuba and I'm really afraid. And I said, I see yellow butterflies all over. Um, when you're in Cuba, look for yellow butterflies. I said, and she goes, what? And I said, that's a, that means God's with you. Just for Cuba, God's with you. And she goes, okay. And I'm like, that's all I got. Have a good day. And she goes, okay. And she walks off. We bless her. You know, She comes back from Cuba. She goes, I got off the plane, went to the beach, and the whole floor was covered in yellow butterflies. She said thousands and thousands of yellow butterflies. She walked into it. Y'all seen those like butterflies, millions of butterflies? She said she walked into this flock of butterflies and she said all of her anxiety and fear disappeared. And when you plug into God, fear has no chance. She had fear and anxiety saying, I'm a girl going to, to Cuba by myself to be a missionary and God said look for yellow butterflies makes no sense to me made no sense to her 
it did to her when she saw thousands and thousands of butter, yellow butterflies. That's why I'm trying to encourage y'all. You hear the voice of God. You're saved. It's like you have a, the moment you say, yes, Jesus, you have a spiritual antenna. You know, like 4G, 5G, 3G. You have Jesus Christ antenna. You're suddenly attuned to God. And I'm saying, you hear God. Some of y'all may doubt it. Some of you younger people may doubt it. But you hear God. And it's okay to say yes to God. I'm going to skip around a little bit. So a friend of ours walks up to me and said, man, I've been stuck with God for a long time. I, I don't know what he wants. And God showed me a book with a lightning bolt on it. And I said, do you have a book with a lightning bolt on it? And she goes, yes. I don't even know where it's at. I said, it's on, it's on the floor in your living room under a blanket. And she goes, uh, okay. I said, God told you to read it two months ago. There's something in there for you. Read it until you get what God wants to tell you and do it. And she goes, God told me to read it about two months ago. She goes, it's under the blanket in my living room. And I was like, yeah. And she went there, found it. She walked over, picked up the blanket book with a giant lightning bolt on it. Makes no sense. But I'm not the only one that can do that. Y'all can. A prophet's job is to equip the body to prophesy. That's the only difference. I hear God, I equip you. You hear God, you go and do it. It doesn't mean I have a greater gift of prophecy. It means I carry a greater, a greater, a greater burden to, to teach people to hear from God. Is that making sense? When you meet a prophet, hey, it's your job to equip, equip you, that's it. You honor them, hey, thank you for sharing, thank you for equipping me. But their gift of prophecy may not be as accurate as yours, even if you're not a prophet. Is that making sense? A teacher's gift, the office of a teacher, the gift is to teach you how to teach. A pastor's gift is to teach you how to shepherd in love. Yeah, he's supposed to shepherd you and love you, but he's supposed to activate that in you too. Why? Because everything Christ has done, we can do it and greater, right? Y'all believe that truth? Jesus was the greatest prophet of them all. Great Jesus was the greatest teacher of them all. Jesus was the greatest shepherd of them all. Jesus was the greatest apostle of them all. And the Holy Spirit, who is Christ manifested, lives in you. What does that mean? That means you can do all things he has done in greater. You carry it all in you. And it's it's the office's job, the five offices job to, to, to unlock those things in you and get you to believe it. I see y'all believing now. You're sitting here going, okay, I'm gonna start trying this. And don't be worried if you get it wrong the first two or three times. The enemy wants is a discourager and wants to discourage you. But when you start getting things right, keep going. Keep going. You can reach people I'm never going to see. There's a circle that only you can reach. There are people that only you can talk to. I can't hang out with your friends. They're going to think I'm crazy, right? How old are y'all? You're in the teens, <coughs> early 20s? Yeah. If I walk up to your friends and I start prophesying to them, some of them they may think I'm crazy. But if you sit there and you go, hey, what happened to you last night? I feel that you're, you're sad. They'll open up to you. Does that make sense? I've gone up to people where, like I was, I think I was sharing with Debbie and our friend Wanda and Olivia just a few days ago. And I said, if you get an impression of an age when you're talking to somebody, Wanda ministers in prison. I said, if you get an impression of an age, just God gave me a word of knowledge to say what happened to you at 16, what happened to you at 21, what happened to you at 35, right? I've said that to a 35 year old and he goes, I had a devastating divorce. I said that to a, a guy who was 28, I said, at 12 years old, what happened to you with drugs? And he goes, that's when I started using drugs. What happened since? I went to prison twice. I was in Florida talking to this guy. And I said, 
Do you want that past to be washed away? Jesus can do it. In the natural, there's a record. A friend of ours went to prison. He has teardrops, which you all know what teardrops mean, right? Went to prison. He says when he came out of prison, he went back to the parole officer and they couldn't find his records. It was literally wiped clean. It disappeared from the database, disappeared. The paper records disappeared. They couldn't find, they couldn't find his records of, of what caused him to have teardrops. And, the, and he said, what did that mean? He goes, you have a misdemeanor for drugs. That's, that's the only thing left on your record. We can't find the other stuff. And he's arguing with the police officer. Look, I have teardrops, man. Look for my records. I'm, I'm supposed to check in with you. And he goes, you don't, owe me, you don't have to check in with me anymore. We can't find your records. Now, God will wipe your slate clean spiritually for sure. And once in a while, God will wipe your, your police record clean. That's amazing. And that's a prophecy. That's a spirit of prophecy right there. If people have a police record, hey, say, Lord, I received that, and I want that to happen to my record. Expunge it, wash it clean, erase it. Y'all getting me? The power of prophecy? As you release a testimony like that, prophecy can happen. Stage four cancer, getting you healed, that's a testimony. But me speaking it out becomes a prophecy for it to happen again. It's real simple, right? I'm trying to, do, to take the mystique out of prophecy and make it a normal thing. Your family, y'all should be get, sitting together prophesying with each other. If you, if you all come home and one of your brothers looks down and she, he won't tell you what's happening, say, Lord, what can I say to him? What happened? How much more powerful for them to say, my sister loves me and God loves me or my cousin loves me, right? Um, so much that he sought God for me. Let's talk about dreams a little bit. I had a dream one time that Olivia's brother got uh, T-boned. He was driving his blue truck and I saw the, the color of the car that hit it and he got pushed into a, um, a ditch. I woke up told Olivia. Olivia goes, what are you supposed to do with that? I said, not tell him. Let's pray. Because in the truck, in the dream, he died. So we prayed that God would save him and let him live and this and that. A few weeks later, he, he drove a different car to our house. And I said, you buy a new car? He goes, I got T-boned two or three days ago. He goes, my car's totaled. I didn't have a scratch on me. Why? We prophesied that. We prophesied no accident. We also prophesied if there is an accident, he's gonna live and not die. Even though the dream I had showed him dying, right? And he said, I got T-boned. The guy was going like 80 miles per hour, pushed me into a ditch and I'm waiting. And Olivia goes, okay, so Jonathan had a dream. You got T-boned, you got pushed in the ditch and you died. We prayed against it. And he goes, I didn't have a scratch on me. I didn't have a, I didn't have a sore neck. But he said, man, he came out of nowhere. The spirit of prophecy, y'all. The spirit of prophecy is God. Anytime you see a spirit of something that's good, that's, that's, he's basically saying that's the Holy Spirit. Because God has so many different identities. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and you know, Prince of Peace, all these things. Those are all, that's all God. It sounds confusing when you first, when I first got saved, it was very confusing. I'm like, well, that's him too? That's him too? How many names does he have? Why is, he, why is this so confusing? I'm just gonna stick with father. <laughs> you know, I made it really simple. When you meet a new believer, you can make it simple. You don't have to sit in a, in a church and wait until you're ready. You're ready now. You can get used now. God is coming back for a spotless bride that's ready and radiant. But the spotless bride that's ready and radiant is the bride who's active, who's filling them, their, 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 their lampstand full of oil, the Holy Spirit. And, and it's, it's a fresh anointing every day. Y'all want any of that? I'm going to start releasing and praying for y'all real quick. 
So in Jesus' name, we just thank you for this crew. Every single person who wants to experience the spirit of prophecy flowing at the level of Jesus Christ, not Jonathan, Christ is greater than me. Christ in me and Christ in you is greater than all of us. So they are filled with the Holy Spirit. If anyone wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit right now who is not filled, Holy Spirit, fill them, fill them, fill them. May, your, may, they, may their ears hear your voice and may their, may their mouth speak your words. May they not add to the words that you give them. May they, may they not add to the visions of their eyes as you begin to give them visions, signs, miracles, and wonders. May they flow through them in Jesus' name. Amen. So how do you prophesy? I'm almost done. You pray and seek God's heart. In the position I'm in, in our church, and also in, in, in our, our, our circle, I go around and activate in everyone I speak to. Because hearing God's voice is fundamental Christianity. Y'all believe me? It's fundamental. My sheep hear my voice. So I'm telling you, even if you think you don't hear his voice, you hear his voice. It may be through visions, it may be through a feeling, it may, it may be through a thought. I'm encouraging you to trust those things. Practice with your parents. Just say, Dad, hey, I'm feeling this about you. Does that make sense? If he says, no, not, I don't think so, whatever. But if it, if it sounds like something good, just it, if someone says that to you and it sounds like something good, hey, you seem sad, are you sad? I don't think so, but you can pray sadness off of me. Encourage them. Now, don't prophesy bad things over people. Like, I saw the accident. I'm not going to call it, hey, dude, I saw you get an accident and die. Prophetic word, see you later. I was like, I, I saw that dream and I went, God, Olivia goes, what do we do? I don't know. Ask God, okay. God said, pray. Let's pray. That's, I didn't have to release it to him that he was going to die and a T boned. It serves me no purpose. What are people going to say? Man, Jonathan's a great prophet. He prophesied his, 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 uh, Brother-in-law's death and it happened. I'd rather be known in heaven and God goes, man, I showed him this t tragedy and no one knows that he prayed it away. You want to be famous in heaven, right? Forget being famous on earth. I don't care about being known. My credit in heaven is if Dennis is known, if you're known, if you're known, man, if y'all are big names and y'all are out there in the spotlight for God, I'm accredited that. I have opportunities to speak at pretty big venues sometimes. I've been interviewed at some of the larger churches in the, in the world. Y'all know Bethel, right? Bethel interviewed me twice about my book. And I, was, I wasn't sure if I wanted to say yes, because I was like, what if people start knowing me? It's not a dream of mine to get known, but man, it's a dream for y'all, for of mine, for y'all to get known in heaven. I want y'all to get when y'all make it to the make it to heaven. I want them to all to applaud and admit, man, you lived an exciting life. You kept your angels busy. There are angels sitting around going, man, I'm bored. I wish he would say, oh, I wish he would say what God is telling him to say. As soon as you release it, the angels like, oh yes, it's their job to do what God says. Angels of God hearken to God's word. We have the power of life and death. So when we speak we're, and we partner with God, we're speaking his word. We speak death to the enemy and his works. Not, not, not people with the enemy affecting them. We speak, we speak life to those people, death to their works, and life to, 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 to situations. One thing I do is I pray in tongues when I pray for somebody. Some people walk up to me and says, God said you have a word for me. Don't do that to me. It, it frustrates me. Because I'm like, I'm like, you're telling me I'm not hearing from God. If God had a word for you, I would, I would know. But a lot of times when people do that, I don't turn them away. Olivia sees me, I, I just pause for a moment. I'm like, I don't have one at the moment. Let's see what God has to say. And I pray in tongues and I wait for the, my heavenly language. I wait for God to give me a download. 
this one kid walks up to me. His name was Daniel. I was speaking to a bunch of youth. I'm 41. So anyone under, under 35 is young to me now. So it was 18 to 35 year olds. He walks up to me. God said, you have a word for me. And I went, God didn't tell me, but let's see what God has to say about you. Because God is always speaking and he loves you. Approach it in love. I put my hand on his chest and I said, man, you have a, a soul tie with your ex-girlfriend and you have a, yeah, there's a charm that you rub on your keychain. Does that make sense? And he goes, my ex-girlfriend gave me this charm. And I said, under your box, you have a bunch of photos. Does that make sense? He goes, yes. And I said, she's never going to be your wife. Throw it all away. And your wife's going to come in about five or six years. He was like 16. I want a wife. I'm like, man, when I was 16, I got married. I, I don't think I would have lasted. We got married at 33. So thank goodness I waited until I was old enough and mature enough to get married. But God had a prophetic word for him. Word of knowledge and a prophetic act. Throw it all away. Don't be stuck on that woman. And don't, don't give a word unless you get a word. If you don't get a word, give it a word of encouragement. Hey, God bless you. If I say that, that's a prophetic word still. Wait until God gives you a vision, a thought, or feeling, a word, audible word, and give that. Don't, God says don't add or subtract from our word, right? He's not just talking about his written word. He's talking about his spiritual word, his rhema word. There's power. Is that making sense? There's two words, his spoken written word. And then there's, there's, and then God gives you signs, miracles, wonders through visions and dreams. But when you get something, don't automatically assume what you're, that you're supposed to do the same thing you did last week when you got a similar vision from someone else. Ask God what to do with that. Everything turns back to God. I, I, I turn everyone back to God because man, he, he died to have a relationship with you. He died for you personally. He died and he says, what's your name? Bree? Brandon? Brayden. Well, he died for you, Brayden. He died, he says, man, I see Brayden face to face, but I want him to see my face, God says. It's that personal. I think we have to make the cross personal. There's a scripture that says, pick up your cross. Well, in the new in the in the Passion translations, it says, "Pick up the cross that that Jesus died on for you. Like, pick up your salvation. And His cross is light for us now. He carried the burden. The cross was. Can you imagine hanging by two nails in your hand and one nail through your feet? That's a lot of weight." And three nails. Man, I can't imagine that burden. He had the weight of the world on him. And he gladly took it. So his cross for us now is light. We pick up the salvation, the life that he he died for. And we, and we live according to the spirit. He died to fill us with the Holy Spirit. He says, I have to go so the counselor can come and fill you. How can he leave you or forsake you if he lives in you? It's good to say, Holy Spirit, come. But I'm saying, hey, be, go try praying this. Holy Spirit, I release you out into this atmosphere. Why? He's, the Holy Spirit is in you. Does that make sense? You walk in a room, God is present. Because you carry him. I was out in uh, Kenya. I shared this, and I think Debbie thought it was the funniest thing. I was out in Kenya, I was a missionary in Kenya, and I'm driving by this giant, thousands of people were gathered at a witch doctor conference. I looked at the, the taxi cab driver and I said, Wilson, what's that witch doctor conference? Awesome. Hey, drop me off. I'm driving to a conference to speak to saved Christians. I'm like, why, why am I preaching to saved Christians? I should be in there preaching to the people who need Christ. And I said, drop me off. And he goes, they'll kill you. They sacrifice kids and people. And I went, why are you speeding up? Pull over. Turn around. He was like, no, I am not going to be responsible for, for American pastor's death. I'm like, 
pull around, man. I said, I will get half of them saved before they kill me. I didn't get a word that I was going to get killed, but I got a word that very moment. God put a thing in my heart and it says half of them will get saved when you walk on that stage. And I was like, and I told God, even if I die, I want to see that come to pass. That taxi cab driver drove as fast as he can through the biggest potholes in the world to get me away from that situation because he was sure I was going to die. Man, when you're with Christ and you, and you do what he says, you're fearless. First Corinthians 14.3. I'm reading this from the Passion Translation. But when someone prophesies, he speaks to encourage people to build them up and to bring them comfort. Now, there's a difference. Old Testament prophecy came from a prophet only. Why? Because God spoke to through a person. New Testament prophecy, you're filled with God. Now he can speak through you. Does that make sense? Old Testament prophecy, that whole, there was no chance for salvation, so they always corrected. You listen, you read the Old Testament prophets, a lot of them were correcting, calling down fire and stuff. New Testament prophecy, we have Jesus Christ. We have hope. The gift of prophecy is the same, but the deliverance of prophecy changed. Now it's to encourage, to build up, and to bring comfort. Y'all are New Testament prophesiers, and you're going to encourage, build up, and bring comfort. A lot of prophetic people I've met are stuck in the Old Testament prophet. I see this sin. You're a sinner. You're going to hell. I remember being a, a Buddhist. Someone said that to me, and I was like, who are you to tell me I'm going to hell? But I walked up to, to sinners on the street, prostitutes. I ministered to a lot of prostitutes in the past. And I said, man, I see a crown on your head. This is a 68-year-old woman who's been a prostitute for 45 years. And she looked like she was 90. She's been in the sun. And I said, man, I see a crown on your head. Do you know that God calls you his daughter and you're his, or you're his princess? And she was like, you don't know what I've done. And I was like, you're, you're focused on you. Do you know what he did? And because of that, you are washed clean. Do you want Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? How much more power is that? To look at someone who's homeless prostitute, 40 years of prostitution, and you tell her her true identity in Christ. If I walked up to her, you're going to hell without Christ. No crap. I know I'm going to hell. You, you don't know what I've done. I'm a prostitute. But if I walked up to her and said, God calls you princess and daughter, and God died for your sins so you can be restored to him and go to heaven. Which is more powerful? Which are you drawn towards? Who am I to say my sin is, her sin is worse than mine? We shouldn't be in a, in a life where we compare sins. We should be in a life where we speak the life. We introduce people to the king of kings. I'm going to skip all this and just go to my ending. Um, and I love that girl. She got saved. She, she went to a, a drug rehab. She was on drugs for 35 years. The first five years, she did all that stuff without drugs and had to use the drugs to drown out the pain. And she was out of drug rehab in three days. No, no withdrawals. I've been on drugs before. Which alcohol withdrawal sucks. Other drugs I've done, the withdrawals suck. I can't imagine being on it for 35 years. You're supposed to have these extreme withdrawals. But God gave her grace, washed her clean, she had no withdrawals, and she walked out a brand new person. That's how you prophesy. That's how you speak life. You prophesy from the New Testament. Is that making sense? The Old Testament prophet no longer exists because Jesus came and showed us what a prophet is with the Holy Spirit, speaking life.
he spoke life. If you read every red word, he spoke life. Yeah, and mystery sometimes, but he spoke life to encourage you to do more. Well, if you're watching right now, and if you're here, if you've never dedicated your life to Christ, like fully, saying, I'm all in, I invite you to receive it now. Or if you're here and you're like, man, I've been kind of lukewarm, and you're ready for God to turn up the heat, not to burn you, but to set you ablaze for the world to see, I invite you to receive that now. Just close your eyes. It doesn't have to be a public spectacle. And say, Jesus Christ, I am yours forever. Set me ablaze. You are my Lord and Savior. And I believe that simple prayer has recalibrated your entire life to be aligned with Christ and Christ alone. And I bless you. And I thank you all for joining us. And I just thank you all for welcoming to, to this church. God bless y'all.